Well, do turn back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We uh, in Britain live in a society that uh, cherishes the concept of rights, the right to life, the right to a fair trial, the right to privacy and the right to reign are some of the many rights that we've seen people vociferously campaigning for in recent years. But rights aren't just the preserve of the political arena, are they? If you go along to any high street bookshop and look under the section entitled Popular Psychology, you'll find countless books informing you of your personal rights and telling you that if you want a good life, while you need to fight for these rights. Now, having surveyed the best sellers, I found that apparently I have the right to be who I want to be, the right to be happy, the right to be angry, the right to be successful, the right to be fulfilled. And my personal favorite, Apparently, I have the right to make statements which have no logical basis and which I do not have to justify. (laughs) Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not dishing the rights movement altogether. There are things, for example, in the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights which are valuable and which help protect people from abuse and oppression. But there is still something in our preoccupation with rights as opposed to responsibilities which seems a little self-centered. For too often, the concern for rights seems to be more about looking after ourselves than looking after anybody else. One only has to glance at the titles of those pop psychology bestsellers to realize that. Titles like, How to Get What You Want, How to Make People Do What You Want, and a guide to living your dreams. They leave you in no doubt that self is at the heart of many people's commitments to rights. And in a society saturated with such thinking, it's hardly surprising if it seeps into the Christian community, such that we see Christians who appear more interested in themselves than others. Individuals who think in terms of their right to good teaching pastoral care, a successful youth group for their children, but who don't give a second thought about how they can help in these matters. Church members who believe it's their right to get their own way, even if that causes others problems, even hurt. Well, none of this is new. As we were reminded last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, For in that chapter, we saw that the Corinthian church included some reasonably knowledgeable, biblically literate Christians who sadly weren't putting their knowledge to good use. Rather, they were using their Bible knowledge to impose their rights and freedoms on others, even if that upset, distressed those others. And so at the end of chapter 8, Paul rebukes them, makes it clear that Christ-like behavior does not selfishly insist on one's rights, but willingly gives up those rights in order to prevent others from stumbling. Look at me at chapter 8, verse 13, where we finished last week, and we can see that. 8, verse 13, therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so I will not not cause him to fall. As As a meat lover, that is a pretty radical step to take, isn't it? And it's one that generally doesn't sit comfortably with us. But when we're called to give up our rights and freedoms, things we even enjoy, even if that's temporarily we instinctively think that's not fair. We think it's not fair that I'm deprived of my right to drink a glass of wine or watch that horror film or go shopping on a Sunday just because of someone else's conscience, to name three issues that Ben mentioned last week. And yet that's what the gospel calls us to do. And today in chapter 9, we see that Paul expands on that 
by giving us a personal example. Actually, he gets personal because he has to defend himself against the accusation that he wasn't a proper apostle. You see, it, it seems that some in the church in Corinth were concerned that um, Paul wasn't paid the sort of salary you'd imagine an apostle to be paid. In fact, he, he wasn't paid anything at all. And he supported himself by working as a tent maker. Now, tent making was a, was a menial job. And so some concluded, well, he can't have been anyone important at all, can he? If that's what he was doing. And never in this chapter, Paul has to explain himself. But he does so in reference to what he said in chapter 8. In fact, it becomes clear that the reason Paul forgoes financial support is precisely because he is putting into practice exactly what he was telling them to do in chapter 8. You see, with Paul, it's not just, you know, you do one thing and I do another. No. And that means that although he is a genuine apostle, with all of the rights and freedoms that that gives him, he is prepared to give up those rights when the gospel demands it. You see, Paul was a gospel-shaped individual. And uh, in this chapter, I, I think we see three characteristics particularly that show he's gospel-shaped. Actually, three characteristics that can be found in all people who are willing to be shaped by the gospel. What are they? Well, the first is sacrifice. In the first half of chapter 9, in verses 4 to 14, Paul labors the fact that as a true apostle, he has the right to financial and material support. We're not going to look at those verses in detail, but suffice to say that Paul appeals to human reason, the Old Testament, the Corinthians themselves, and the Lord Jesus to support this idea. And so by the end, there's absolutely no doubt that Paul has established the right to be paid for gospel work that he's engaged in. But after having really emphasized that point for 10 verses... Paul writes in the second half of verse 12, but we did not use that right. And at the start of verse 15, but I have not used any of these rights. Paul might have the right to payment, but he's not going to stand on that right. In fact, quite the opposite. He sacrifices it. Why? Well, look with me at the second half of verse 12 again. Verse 12. But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Elsewhere, uh, Paul hints at a way in which the gospel could be hindered. You see, at that time, there were many sort of um, pseudo-religious salesmen who traveled around fleecing people they taught. And therefore, by not accepting any payment, Paul sought to remove himself from the accusation that he was no different from those salesmen peddling their wares. And also, by doing that, he was preventing the gospel from being discredited. And that is, of course, something we must continue to work at today. It's always true. For in the face of... Uh, some infamous TV evangelists, we, may, we must make clear that the gospel is not a cover for making money. In fact, that is one reason we don't pass a collection bag around in our services. We want to be clear that the gospel is offered freely and that Jesus wants to have a relationship with you regardless of what you've given to the church. That's us, but back to Corinth. And I hope you can see the difference between the church and Paul. The church waxed lyrical about their freedoms and insisted on standing on them. Paul realized that such freedom included the freedom not to do things, out of love for others. And he demonstrated that by refusing payment for his preaching. Having said that, I think there's even more 
to Paul's sacrifice than this. And we can see that in verses 15 to 18. Now, it's quite intricate arguing, so I'm going to read these verses out slowly, commenting as we go, and hopefully you'll be able to follow along with me. So verse 15. But I have not used any of these rights. That's rights to payment. And I'm not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. In other words, this isn't a thinly veiled begging letter. You know the sort. We're not after your money, but... (laughs) No, rather he says, for I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. Now, what's he boasting in? Well, earlier in 1 Corinthians, he's told us that the only thing he boasts in or glories in is the cross of Christ. And so what he's saying here is that I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of glorying in the cross. Verse 16. But when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast or glory since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Now, Paul was uniquely compelled to preach the gospel, uniquely very different from someone like me, because Jesus struck him down on the road to Damascus and commanded him to preach. He had no choice in preaching. He was simply carrying out the direct orders of Jesus. And Paul clearly thought that as a result of that, well, glorying in the uh, glorying in the cross involved doing more than just carrying out his orders. And verses 17 and 18 expand on that. Look with me at those verses. Verse 17, if I preach voluntarily, which he didn't, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. For Paul, it appears that uh, if he's to glory in the cross of Christ, then he needs to go the second mile, like Jesus did for him. Jesus willingly went the second mile. He gave his all, didn't he? And so Paul doesn't just do what he has to do, but he does something more. He has to preach the gospel. Jesus gave him that job. But he doesn't have to preach it for free. Yet he does so willingly. And by doing so, he ensures that he doesn't hinder or deny the gospel, but rather he embodies it. He takes the gospel of free grace and offers it freely. And so his life is a a paradigm of the gospel he preaches. Uh, when I was a, a, a school pupil, I had a teacher. Um, Bendy was his nickname. He was a maths teacher, not a brilliant one. But what we all noticed was that he went the extra mile for his pupils. He didn't just do what he had to do, but he did more. Whether that be helping us academically in lunchtime or as a, a Christian, setting up and running a Christian union. He didn't have to do that, but he gave up his free time every week in order to help the pupils, arrange CU meetings, set out chairs, organize snacks, and hoover up the room after us as we dropped all the snacks on the floor. He really modeled the gospel in the way he lived it. And I wonder, what about us? I wonder, have we sacrificed anything for the sake of the gospel? To go the extra mile? Are we willing to forsake perfectly good and reasonable things so that we can do that for Jesus? I have the privilege of knowing many who have. Some have willingly given up a promotion so that they can remain home group leaders. Others have given up a little more of their salary so that they can support gospel work. Still others willingly sacrifice their Thursday mornings or Friday evenings 
so they can help week in, week out at lunch club or one of our youth groups. And I know scores of people who take a week or two off from work, give up their precious holiday to go and lead on Christian holidays and camps. Some of you here do that. And each year, countless children are amazed that those leaders, those cooks, those cleaners are not being paid for the work they're doing, and they ask, why? You see, as we sacrificially live out the gospel, God uses us remarkably to advance his kingdom. Let's pray that's true of each and every one of us. So that's the first characteristic of the gospel-shaped individual sacrifice. The second one, though, sounds, um, well, sounds even more extreme, for it concerns slavery. And we can see that in verses 19 to 22. Look with me at those verses. Verse 19. Though I am free and belong to no one, I've made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. For those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. Paul starts here, doesn't he, by emphasizing that, again, that although he's free, that doesn't mean he insists on his freedom, at which point we might think he's continuing just to talk about sacrifice, but he's not quite. He, he changes tack a little and talks about becoming a slave to others. This is all about serving. Notice in verse 19, he's not forced into that slavery. Rather, he makes himself a slave, voluntarily does that. Why? Well, at the end of verse 19, he tells us he makes himself a slave to others. He serves people in order to win as many as possible for Jesus. And Paul tells us that serving others includes being prepared to discard any cultural or social barriers that might unnecessarily offend people and so turn them off Christianity. And thus, when evangelizing the Jews, well, Paul behaves in a certain way that will not alienate him. He won't eat Zeus burgers, remember, last week. And when he's with the Gentiles, well, he behaves in a different way in order not to alienate them. And when he's with the weak, well, the principle is the same. And as he writes at the end of verse 22, he is prepared to be as flexible as possible in order that he might save some. Now, having said that, there are limits to what he will do. He clearly won't compromise the gospel message. And also, he won't act deliberately in a way that is immoral or contrary to God's character. Because as he notes at the end of verse 21, he is still under Christ's law. Yet apart from that, Paul is prepared to be a slave to others in order to reach the unbeliever. Once more, though, it's not just unbelievers. It's clear from chapter 8 and chapter uh, 10, which we'll see next week, that his attitude towards fellow Christians is also one of wanting to, to serve them and build them up. See, he doesn't work hard at winning people for Christ to then treat them badly when they become Christians. No, his lifelong task is to serve all people always. And he refers, and he reinforces that in verse 23, when he says he does it for the sake of the gospel. Actually, the, uh, sadly, the NIV doesn't quite capture what's written in the original at the end of verse 23. Literally, Paul writes, verse 23, and I do all things because of the gospel, that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Which, um, like in verses 15 to 18, seems again to convey the fact that Paul believes that he does it in order that he can 
share in the nature of the gospel, to stand alongside, to identify with, to, to serve the Jew, the Gentile, the vulnerable, all types of people, that is to live out what the gospel stands for. Jesus came to this earth, didn't he, to serve people. He's a servant king. That is what he calls us to do too. And that's what Paul was putting into practice and is urging the Corinthians and us to do the same. So what about us? Who's slave are we? Who are we putting ourselves out for in order to win them for Christ or build them up in the faith? Again, when I was a school pupil, I was particularly uh, particularly struck by two friends who were always willing to put themselves out for me. Their, Their commitment to me, come what may, made me ask questions about what motivated them. Ultimately, it was that that helped bring me to Christ. I hope that's an encouragement to any teenagers here this morning. You can make a difference just by the way you live. And today I can can instantly think of some individuals who particularly exemplify this principle of slavery. Actually, they tend to be people who work away behind the scenes, but who have a real heart for serving others. Visiting the lonely or ill, babysitting for others, shopping for those who are housebound. Uh, Of course, we can't do this for everyone. But the question is, do we seek to serve anyone, even one other person? The gospel calls us to do so. And as such, if if you're finding your faith running a bit cold at the moment, if, if you're finding your Christian life a bit unexciting, it might just be because you're not actually being a slave to anyone at the moment. And as such, you're not living out the gospel. Two characteristics of the gospel shape person, sacrifice and slavery. As we draw to a close, I want us briefly to note a third characteristic, the characteristic of self-discipline. That can be seen in verses 24 to 27. Let me Read verses 24 to 27 again. Verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will be not disqualified for the prize. Paul makes his point by um, using imagery from the athletics world, which will be appealed to some of us more than others. But his focus here is upon the dedication and determination that's needed in order to get the crown, which for the Christian is eternal life. You see, it's not easy to follow Christ and live a a cross-shaped, gospel-shaped life. Sacrifice and slavery are not easy. They require self-discipline. The temptation will always be to live for self, to live for the now, to live within our comfort zone, But Paul exhorts us here to keep our eye on the goal, not to give in to the temptation. Some days, athletes don't feel like training. Apparently, every day I don't feel like training. But for athletes, they don't feel like training on some days. And some days, we're not going to feel like making sacrifices and serving others. And yet if the athlete perseveres, they discover it's worth the effort. They get the prize. And in the end, if the Christian is self-disciplined and keeps going, then they will discover it is 
worth it. We will get that heavenly reward. But if they don't keep going, well, there is a debate about what Paul means in verse, at the end of verse 27. Uh, we know from elsewhere that true Christians can't lose their salvation. But despite that theological debate, as far as the Corinthians were concerned, and as far as we're concerned, this verse represents a real warning, doesn't it? For at the end of the day, it will not be good enough to profess with our mouths that we're Christians. It will not be good enough to parade our knowledge before God and others if such things are not accompanied by a real love for God and for others. A love that shows itself in our actions. If that is absent, we will be found wanting. We'll be exposed as those who've had false faith. And as such, we'll be disqualified from the prize of eternal life. We might be saved by faith in Christ and not works. But a true faith will always show itself in works. And in particular, it will show itself in the way we behave towards one another which is a solemn ending, isn't it? And one that should, again, cause us to examine our hearts to make sure that our faith is genuine. Well, at the start, I said that it was easy for Christians to become sucked into a selfish preoccupation with our rights and freedoms. However, I hope that Paul's example here helps us to see the error of such thinking. For a mature Christian will willingly embrace sacrifice, slavery, self-discipline for the sake of the gospel, even if that means giving up some of our rights. A mature Christian is someone who goes the way of the cross. The question is, will we go that way? With that in mind, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to, as we consider this challenging passage, we're really aware that we need your forgiveness and your help. And we thank, so we thank you that you provide both. We need your forgiveness for there have been many times where we have selfishly been preoccupied with what we want to do rather than sacrificially serving others in a self-disciplined way. And so we thank you, Heavenly Father, again for the forgiveness that is available in Jesus. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that his example will spur us on to be different. But we need more than example. We need help because we're weak. And so we thank you that, as we sang with the children earlier, we have help from your Spirit. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that your Spirit might be at work in our lives, changing our minds and hearts, giving us determination and a strength of will to enable us to be self-disciplined even in this coming week. And we pray this, Heavenly Father, so that your gospel might be not hindered, so that others might see the beauty of Jesus in us, and so we might build one another up in the faith. And we pray all of this for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.